Okay, so um, yes, that's what I'm going to talk about. Well, I'm going to give you some basic background on what, what we work on, but I haven't got time in, in the time allocated to talk about all the things that we do. But I need to draw attention to a couple of colleagues, particularly relevant to the models I'll talk about, Aras, who's going to be talking after me anyway, uh, and Dr. Joe Fothergill. So just generally, the sort of research that we do uh, is around uh, the genomics, in particular the application of genomics, but other techniques as well to understand how bacteria behave during infections. So particularly I'm interested in gram-negative bacteria and uh, things like Campylobacter and E. coli, but a particular focus on Pseudomonas aeruginosa and in particular respiratory infections. So just a little bit about Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for those of you who don't know anything about it. It's, it's a very common pathogen in those lists of pathogens that cause infections of various kinds in hospitals. It usually comes third, fourth, or fifth in just about all of the lists. So it causes a whole range of different uh, infections, potentially. And when it causes them, they tend to be quite severe infections. So it will cause outbreaks in intensive care units, neonatal units, etc. And it will cause sepsis as well. One of the reasons why this kind of organism and uh, organisms similar to it are of particular interest these days is because of the issue of antimicrobial resistance. This, this particular type of pathogen is uh, particularly good at being resistant to antibiotics. It's got natural resistance to a lot of the antibiotics we would like to use and it very quickly uh, acquires resistance to other antibiotics that we might want to use. So uh, it's got a number of natural uh, mechanisms for doing this, and it can also acquire resistance from other organisms via mobile elements, for example. Whoops, pressed two at once. Now, we've been particularly interested in research on uh, patients with cystic fibrosis, but the sort of chronic lung infections that I'm talking about also apply to patients with bronchiectasis or COPD. Uh, but cystic fibrosis, there's about 10,000 patients in the UK with cystic fibrosis. It's a genetic disorder. And the most important characteristic of those with the gene defect is that they are not able to easily resist infections with bacteria, chronic lung infections, and particularly Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And they require a lot of therapy. They're on a lot of drugs all the time. Pseudomonas in these kinds of infections does particular things it starts to produce this polysaccharide called alginate, and it certainly adopts a biofilm-type lifestyle. And in fact, once, the, once established as an infection in the patients, the patient has this infection for the rest of their lives, so they're just constantly on antibiotics. And every now and again, they're particularly ill with these inflammatory exacerbations, and they're taken into hospital and given really high doses of intravenous antibiotics. So there's a really high treatment burden associated with these sorts of patients. So, we have been involved with a lot of research, which I'm not going to talk about, into identifying particular strains and understanding how the bacteria behave during infections and so forth. I was just going to focus on a couple of models that have been of interest to uh, collaborators, including industrial collaborators. The first one is called the artificial sputum medium uh, model. It's essentially artificial spit. Uh, sputum, of course, is what the patients produce a lot of, which is why it's very interesting to, and easy to research into bacterial behavior in cystic fibrosis. The reason why we like this model is because I said that they form biofilms, but normally people work on surface-attached biofilms, such as biofilms attached to catheters and that type of thing. Now, that's not what happens in these patients. They actually form these, uh, uh, these plugs of bacteria aggregated to each other and to mucins. So they're sort of free-formed, essentially snotty-looking uh, biofilms. And that's exactly what you get in this medium, which has ingredients that resemble what you find in CF patients' puter. You get this floating aggregate. And when you look at explanted lungs, lungs from CF patients who have had lung transplants, that's what the bacteria look like. Uh, and we, we like it because of that, and we also like it because the bacteria behave very similar to what they do in patients. They start to diversify and accumulate mutations. So we've developed this into a high-throughput um, assay for testing, essentially for testing antibiotics. So if you, the, the normal sort of methods of testing antibiotics uh, in diagnostic labs will use aerobic conditions and bacteria grown on rich media. In fact, the real conditions are much more like this. 
biofilm conditions and also using this method which you can use in a micro tighter plate you can even do micro aerophilic conditions which is thought to be much more similar to what the bacteria are experiencing so it works by forming the biofilm in the micro tighter plate and then using your antimicrobials to attack it and there's a sort of live dead, live dead stain for fluorescence to look at the efficacy of your antimicrobial agents. And if you use this, you'll get very different answers. Remember, these patients are on antibiotics for very long periods of time. Often there's no evidence whatsoever that the antibiotics are having any effect on the bacteria, but we still use them in large amounts. So there's a real desperate need for novel therapeutic agents. So this is one method we would recommend for testing new agents, and we have done that with, in collaboration with industrial partners. And the other method is this uh, uh, murine model developed in Aras's lab. Now previously, chronic infection models for respiratory infections have relied generally on an artificial system where you Im embed the bacteria essentially in a polysaccharide mesh and put it straight into the lungs. This method, actually this model, uh, involves natural inhalation and establishment of infection. It's something we published in Nature Communications at the end of last year. And if you look on here, this is the, the numbers in the nasopharynx and the numbers in the lungs. This is of a relatively short period. This is what normally happens when you try to do an inhalation model. The numbers crash in the lungs and it looks like it's not going to work. But in fact, if you leave it long enough, they start to come back from the lungs. And in fact, they seem to seed down from the nasopharynx, adapted bacteria that then established in the lungs, which is actually very similar to what we suspect happens in real infections. But even better than that, if you take some of the isolates that have been through the model and adapted and put them through the model again, you start to see some of them that can actually, even in the lungs, establish really quickly and maintain for long periods. So this has been run uh, up to 28 days so far, but there's no reason why it might not go longer. So we think this is a much better test for therapeutic agents. And we are, we are using this model in collaboration with uh, industrial partners who have novel therapeutic agents already. And that's all I was going to say. <laughs>